2013, the RCPCH published their report, The Overview of Deaths in the Four UK Countries. One of the key findings from this was that a large number of children who died had a chronic condition, and this was most frequently neurological. Following this, NCPOD and Cardiff University were commissioned to undertake a study to look at the care of children and young people with a chronic neurodisability and to identify areas where improvements in care could be made. The cerebral palsies were chosen as the example of condition because they encompass a broad spectrum of severity, because healthcare is delivered in a range of settings and because there's evidence that service provision becomes fragmented following transition. So the study today takes data from a variety of sources, including routinely collected national data and case note review to collate an overall picture of service provision. So from the study outset, we worked with a group of clinicians in the field, known as our study advisory group, and their main role is to form the study method. So one of, I'd like to actually, I think some of them are in the audience today, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for their help with this work. One of the first jobs that we asked the study advisory group to do is to form the study aims and objectives. So the aim of the study is to review the quality of care provided to children and young people with a chronic neurodisability using cerebral palsy as the example of condition. We also aimed to examine the interface between care settings and also to assess the transition of care from paediatric to adult services. So in terms of the objectives, those areas of care we look, wanted to look at in more detail. There are a number of organisational objectives, including access to healthcare services, including pathways of care, and the delivery of healthcare services, including to access to MDT teams. We also wanted to collect patient and parent carer data to understand the views of service users. We had a number of clinical objectives, including clinical services, including access to professionals and procedures, symptom management, including associated conditions and comorbidities, support services, communication, training for the patient, the parent carer and professionals, safeguarding, transition and decision making, including capacity, competency and best practice. So all hospitals where they may care for children with chronic neurodisability were asked to participate in the UK-wide study. In terms of the study population, we aim to collect data on all patients aged 0 to 25 years who were admitted to hospital with one of the ICD-10 codes for cerebral palsy, G80 to G83, who were admitted between Monday the 7th of September and Sunday the 18th of October 2015. So we know that we're identifying patients um, from a hospital admission, um, and this really is the tip of the iceberg. A majority of patients with cerebral palsy aren't admitted to hospital. Um, but because of the complexity of identifying patients in the community and through GP practices, a pragmatic decision was made that this was the best approach to use for this study. In terms of case identification, we have a nominated contact within each hospital, known as our local reporter, who acts as a link between us and the trust in terms of accessing patient data. Again, I know a number of local reporters are in the audience today, and so I'd like to thank them for their help with this work. So at the study outset, the local reporter was contacted and asked to populate the case identification spreadsheet and basically list us, give us the details of all patients who were admitted to their hospital with one of the included procedure codes during the study period. Upon receipt at NCPOD, this was uploaded to our study database and we sampled 10 cases per site, per hospital, for inclusion in the, in the peer review process using a number of uh, variables to ensure that we had a good mix of medical and surgical cases to review. A number of questionnaires we used to collect data for this study. The first to be disseminated was the organisational questionnaire and this was sent out at trust or board level and basically collected data around the facilities and services available within each hospital. Because of the complexity of the service, this questionnaire had to be split into 10 sections to cover inpatient, outpatient, community and allied health professional care for both children and young, pe young people. The next questionnaire to be disseminated was the patient and parent carer questionnaire and this was a short online questionnaire that could be completed via the NCPOD website. Again, this enabled us to collect details around the views of service users. 
Um, and we've already presented some of this data today and be, there is more information available in the report. The final three questionnaires were clinical questionnaires. So the first questionnaire to go out went to the admitting clinician who was responsible for the patient at the time of their admission and collected details around that episode of care. Within this, we also asked whether the patient had a lead clinician who was responsible for providing care, the ongoing care of the patient in the community, and if not, um, what the details of their GP were who were responsible providing, for providing that care. And once we had those details, they were sent either the lead clinician questionnaire or the GP questionnaire to complete. And both of those questionnaires collected data around the three years of community care provided to that patient. Alongside the questionnaires, we asked for copied extracts of the case notes to be returned. For the period of acute care, these included any emergency department records, clinical notes, nursing notes, and emergency healthcare plans. We also asked for any outpatient notes, clinic letters, and discharge summaries for the th three year period prior to the index admission. Alongside the community care questionnaires, we asked for multidisciplinary notes, allied health professional notes, and clinic letters, again for the th three year period prior to the index admission. So taken together with the questionnaires and case notes, we had a comprehensive view of the, of the care that pa the patient had received over a three year period. Upon receipt to NCPOD, these notes were made completely anonymous for patient identifiable information before being reviewed by a multidisciplinary group of reviewers, again clinicians working in the field. Again, I know there are a number of reviewers in the audience today, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank them for all their hard work with this study. So just to give you an idea of numbers, um, over the six week period we were notified of just under 3,500 admissions to hospital. And of these, we, we sampled uh, just over 1,000 for inclusion in the peer review process. So the number of questionnaire and case notes returned are listed at the bottom of this figure. But I think one of the key things to highlight from this slide is the 148 cases who were selected and later excluded, 119 of which were because the patient was subsequently found not to have cerebral palsy. Um, and Alison is going to come on to talk about the coding of cerebral palsy shortly. Um, so just to give you an overview of the population that we were looking at in the peer review process, 55% of the sample were male and 45% of the sample female, and this is actually mirrored in the routine data collection. The ages of the patients ranged between 5 months and 25 years, with an average age of just under 12. So throughout the report, 35 recommendations have been made, and the areas of care that they cover are listed below. 33 of these recommendations relate to the chronic neurodisability as a, as a whole, and two of the re recommendations focus specifically on cerebral palsy. Um, as, as part of this study, we've collected a vast amount of data, and we don't have time to present everything to you today, so we're just going to focus on the principal recommendations. And I'm now going to hand over to Alison to talk through the routine data. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, I'm going to talk about the component of this project that, for the first time in the Child Health Outcome Review, set out to look at the ability of us looking at routinely collected um, national health data and to see to what extent that could uh, give us an overview of the quality and quantity of um, health care utilised by this population. I will have to thank my research team back in Cardiff University, two of whom are here today, Bethan and Jackie, and Howell, uh, Ting and Sarah from uh, Swansea University, um, who have done an enormous amount of work and put this analysis together. As many of you will be aware, um, every time we attend healthcare services, there is some element of data that is routinely collected about the reasons um, why we've attended the treatment that we uh, might be getting. And every one of us has got a unique NHS number. And therefore, there is the potential to link together um, what is happening to us in primary care when we go to the general practitioner, and in the secondary care, if we're admitted to hospital, if we go to outpatients, etc., etc. So this was the, the source of the data that we were able to use. 
The process was very long, as there was an, a huge amount of data preparation that we had to undertake. We initially started by scoping uh, the available data sets that might be useful for the project across the, the UK, um, across the Channel Islands and Isle of Man, and to look at whether the extent to which we could provide a complete picture. There were a number of governance issues and uh, a very extensive application process as we had to apply uniquely to each data provider and each provider had different requirements in terms of the forms that needed to be filled in, the requirements that they uh, expected of us in terms of ethics and uh, research governance around the team who were processing this data set. The data then required to be prepared at the source of, of data. It needed to prepare, be prepared for data linkage and uh, anonymized such that anything that was going into the data that we were analyzing could not be identified back to um, individuals. Once we got the data, it required a considerable amount of cleaning and preparation. Um, bearing in mind that we started this project in, 90, in 2015, the complete data sets came through to us and the final one arrived in October 2017. That isn't to say that we just had three months to analyse everything because uh, data sets were coming through to us in a, in a, in a uh, staggered manner. Um, but it just, I think, I, um, sets out for you the huge process behind this piece of work. The population that we looked at was the same as uh, Heather's already described. Uh, children and young people uh, younger than 25 years of age who had cerebral palsy. Our analysis was stratified into five-year age bands as uh, described there and as you will see in the short report and the, um, the graphs and data that we present. The um, children and young people were resident in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and the data set that we had covered an 11-year period between 2004 and 2014. We were able to undertake a comparative analysis between the children who had cerebral palsy and the children within the data sets who did not have cerebral palsy. This slide um, has a level of complexity, but summarises the data sets that we looked at. And I think it is a, is, um, a graphic that is in the short report that you have and you can study a little more at your leisure. The first column looks at some of the individual data sets that we were able to analyse. We had hoped that we could link some of the cerebral palsy registers, the one that has been collected in the north of England and the one that's collected in the north of Ireland, and to link these into the routinely uh, collected data sets. However, it wasn't possible to do that for the Northern England data set in the timescale of the project, and neither for Northern Ireland. However, we have now got a linked data set, and Bethan is working hard to provide that um, data analysis that will come later in the form of um, a, a published paper. In the full report, however, there are quite detailed analyses from the north of England cerebral palsy register and the Northern Ireland one. And one thing to say quite clearly is that actually those data sets provide a lot more detail in terms of analysis um, as related to the, the severity and the individual um, abilities and difficulties that the children have but we're not going to look at that particularly today, but I commend you to, to look at that in more detail. The second column looks at the uh, linked data sets that were available to us on an individual country basis. For England, we, from NHS Digital, we had inpatient, outpatient data that was um, uh, linked together, to, together with mortality data. For Wales, our options of linked data sets were um, more extensive and included primary care, inpatient, outpatient, and some education data. But this, of course, is on a far smaller population. For Scotland, we had inpatient and outpatient data with the capacity to look at a special needs data set. However, the coverage of that data set was not complete over Scotland and we weren't able to use that. And again, for Nor um, Northern Ireland, you can see there that there's a different um, component of data sets that link together. There's a social care data set that was available. And whilst there wasn't a primary care data set, there was some data around primary care um, prescribing. <coughs> 
The third column just shows you how these data sets went to, came from the data providers in each of the countries and then went to the sale um, base in Swansea where all of the data cleaning and preparation of, of the work was undertaken for us. The second slide looks at the potential that we had to look at primary care data and uh, where the primary care data was linked into um, the secondary care hospital-based data. For England, we were able to use the clinical practice research data set, which is a data set that um, represents some 7% of uh, people um, in England and 7% of practices. So it is a representational data set, but it's not a complete data set. In Wales, there was the uh, GP data set that currently covers about 77% of practices in Wales. And then moving to look at the second column there, for um, England, the uh, CPRD data set is linked to um, two HES and to some hospital data. So again, we had a representative sample that we could look for there. And again, in Wales, there was a linkage provided. One thing you will notice, the, those of you who um, are alert and aware of these data sets, is that there is currently no option to look at a routinely collected um, data from community services. And many of you will appreciate that many children and young people with cerebral palsy are looked after in the community. So this is a bit of a, a black hole, if you like, and something that currently, within the routinely da collected data, we're not able to look at. This is just um, a slide that just puts together, again, the amount of preparatory work that had to be undertaken when the data came to us. We had to flag cases of uh, cerebral palsy in all of these data sets. We had to identify the codes that we wanted to look at for the associated morbidity, for associated prescribing. We then had to look at the data sets very clearly because despite the fact that the four countries collect their data, they don't collect it in exactly the same way and they don't use exactly the same definitions. So we had to um, define our own way for some level of consistency that we could actually look at and analyse hospital um, admissions in the same way such that it could be compared across the, the data sets. So once all that work had been undertaken by our colleagues in Swansea, the data came to us in Cardiff University for um, some analysis. And just to start by looking at the recommendations that we felt should be made from undertaking this piece of work. And I think the overview of it is that looking at routine data is valuable, but it has many shortcomings at the moment. And I would hope that this piece of work sets out some recommendations as to how we could improve our data collection such that people in general with chronic conditions um, can, we can use it to actually look at and to quantify um, the healthcare utility for um, uh, these populations, but particularly for children and young people with uh, neurodisabling conditions. Jackie was the one who said, rubbish in, rubbish out. Now, I wouldn't want to say that that's what we've come up with. However, unless we collect the data in the correct manner, routinely, consistently, and, and religiously paying attention to detail at the start, that is going to affect any analysis that actually comes out of this work. And that would be our first recommendation that we would want to make. One of the difficulties is that the cerebral palsy wasn't coded at each and every time a child or young person was admitted to hospital. For some people in the 25 years that we looked at their spectrum of health care, her cerebral palsy was coded once. Now for us, that we didn't have the confidence whether that was a correct coding or an incorrect coding. However, those cases were counted into our analysis. But we would recommend that any of the chronic conditions that one has um, and is identified early in life is added to a standardised list of conditions that must always be coded, or is coded once for that uh, person and remains within their coding system. Um, 
we would recommend that standardised health care should be captured by clinicians each time a patient is seen in all settings and to include a community-based organisations. Data about uh, patients with neurodisabling conditions must include a measure of clinical severity and functional abilities to allow us to provide a detailed analysis. Now, there are codes within the currently used ICD coding and read coding that give us the opportunity to code the type of cerebral palsy that to children and young people have, the extent to which uh, they are affected. However, this is rarely used, and the majority of the cases coded used a, a G80.9, which was cerebral palsy unspecified. So this doesn't help us to actually undertake an analysis that is linked to the healthcare needs of individuals. And one needs to bear that in mind when you're looking at the data. It looks at data on a very broad population basis. And unless cases are coded according to clinical severity, we can't provide that nuanced type of analysis. Clinical coding systems should be harmonised across the routine um, collected data sets across the country if we want to provide a harmonised analysis. Um, clearly, with the devolution of healthcare provision across the, the UK, this is quite variable because the data collection is also devolved. But we're a small nation, and if we want to get our population data together, we need to have some level of harmony such that the data can be used in a consistent way across the whole of the UK. Um, and patient records and routine data collections across different healthcare providers should be linked as a matter of routine if we're going to be able to fully quantify the healthcare utilisation in cost across primary and secondary care. So there are a lot of recommendations there. Things should get better, and Karen, as we've already, um, we, we come to know, and has already been discussed today, has worked tirelessly around this issue. And this should improve with some of the forthcoming uh, recoding using SNOMED CT, which does have that capacity to include some of the severity codings, and is coming in across the UK, and there is going to be, as currently has started, a routine data collection for community services. So things should get better. However, this is going to be introduced on a gradual process and will take a little time to come to fruition. If we just have a look, perhaps, at the example here of how we were able to identify cases. And we looked for um, cerebral palsy coding, either in read codes or in ICD, if they were coded at any time during a um, hospital um, event or outpatient event or across the CP, uh, the general practice uh, pathway for individuals. And this uh, Venn diagram simply provides four options as to where we could have identified uh, cases from in the English uh, linked CPRD data set either from inpatients in the purple, from general practice in the green, mortality data or outpatients. And something that I think that Heather alluded to, if we were to have purely used inpatient data there in the purple, we would have under-recognised the number of cases that we, we could see. This uh, Venn diagram overall identified some, about 7,500 cases for us. And you can see that there is an overlap between general practice and inpatient, but we had to use all of these data sets to actually identify our population. One thing which is also quite um, outstanding from this uh, diagram is that the very few patients uh, who were identified from outpatient data. And that is simply because although the numbers of um, cases going through outpatients are recorded, their recording of the reasons why um, uh, individuals attend outpatients is very poorly coded. And again, the community data sets are missing. So just to actually look then at what sort of data was uh, falling out of this. One thing that was reassuring, when we came up with actually looking at our prevalence figures, we came up um, from all of this data from the English data particularly, as an overall pre prevalence of 3.5 children and young people 
with cerebral palsy in the English population, which is a prevalence figure that is relatively consistent with what has been published. And therefore, we had a level of confidence that our, ascert our ascertainment wasn't too bad. This particular slide also confirms for us what we um, already know, in that the prevalence of cerebral palsy increases according to social deprivation. And this is a slide that confirmed that for us. Again, some level of reassurance that um, our data patterns and our ascertainment um, had some uh, credibility. <coughs> this um, particular slide, if I can find the pointer, the end. Oh, the button is for, oh, there it is, got it. Okay. So this is a slide that summarises for us the um, attendance rates in primary and secondary care. The slide looks at our five age groups, from the youngest to the oldest, and looks at our control population, if you like, in orange. These were the children and the young people who don't have cerebral palsy, and our population who do have cerebral palsy in green. The first block in each of these columns looks for us at the uh, attendance in primary healthcare with general practice. And you will see, if you compare each first block in these going across, that uh, for children with cerebral palsy, their attendance rate at primary care is greater than for the population without cerebral palsy, but that the trend for attendance is very similar with the greatest level of rate of attendance in the youngest age group, decreasing for our 5 to 14-year-olds, uh, and increasing again um, in our older age group. So a very similar trend, but to young children and young people with cerebral palsy are attending general practice um, more frequently, more often. If we look then at the second um, bar chart, we're looking there at outpatient attendance. And you'll see that the second bar chart in our orange blocks is pretty consistent across the age group for our outpatients, but decreases in the 20 to uh, 24 year olds. However, for our population with cerebral palsy, the outpatient attendance is dramatically different. Significantly greater by about a factor of 10, greater proportion in our youngest uh, uh, age group, and decreasing as uh, children um, get older and being particularly low in our young adult population. If we're looking at hospital admissions, this is the last block in each of the, the groups. And again, our uh, admission rate for uh, children with, and young people with cerebral palsy is some 10 times greater than their comparative population. So this was an analysis, was able to demonstrate the high extent of utility of our health services by our population of interest. This um, slide looks at the pattern of um, uh, utilisation across the four nations. Um, and you can see that actually it's very similar. The top graph looks at primary care consultations and the bottom graph looks at um, the inpatient data from each of the four countries. And you will see possibly starkly here that the um, pattern looks very similar, but the numbers for our 0 to 4 year olds look surprisingly um, low proportion. This actually is reflected by the fact that within that particular data set, only 60% uh, of um, uh, children and young people with cerebral palsy are, co are recorded in the data set before their fifth birthday. So there is an underrepresentation there of the youngest um, age group. If we were to look at some other pointers, this um, chart looks at the rate of referral between primary care and secondary care and looks at it in terms of deprivation. You can see with the orange comparator group, there is very little difference um, across the levels of deprivation. You have the least deprived on uh, this side of the graph and the most deprived on this side of the graph. And you can see that there is a decrease in referral rate across um, the, the levels of deprivation. And we don't know the reasons behind this, 
but one hypothesizes that perhaps the, the demand is greater from the, the least deprived or in some way recognized more for that, that age group. But this was a, a, a finding that we were somewhat um, surprised about. This uh, chart uh, tracks the outpatient rate of attendance um, across the years of the study. <coughs> It looks at the rates um, across the age groups and shows really the data that we've already seen in that composite um, graph a few slides back, in that the uh, outpatient <coughs> rate is greater the younger the population. However, it shows for all age groups that the rate of outpatient attendance has increased over that 11-year uh, time span, but increased more sharply for the younger population than the older age group. So why are um, children and young people with cerebral palsy attending uh, these different um, sectors of the healthcare service? This uh, looks at the uh, GP <coughs> attendances and shows for both populations that the highest rate of uh, attendance in primary care is for uh, respiratory conditions. Oh, sorry. If we look at um, hospital admissions, these two slides compare the reasons for attendance between emergency attendances and elective attendances. Children and young people with cerebral palsy have a greater proportion of elective attendances than children without cerebral palsy. But the reasons behind this were quite um, different. In the emergency, again, we have a uh, highest rate is for uh, respiratory conditions followed by neurological uh, conditions. In the elective admissions, the highest rate is very much around elective procedures with uh, neuro for neurological um, reasons um, and mental health and behavioural disorders. So these were the top hitters in, in the two different types of admissions. And again, you can see that there are stark differences in the pop two between the two uh, populations. As far as outpatients is concerned, we, as I said, we haven't got the ability to look at the reasons for admissions, but we can look at the specialties that the children and young people um, attend. And we didn't see, therefore, in outpatient data that um, uh, high uh, prevalence of respiratory uh, conditions, but we rather think that that is hidden in the top um, here, which is uh, coded under paediatrics. Um, the th things I think that interested me particularly about outpatients were ear, nose and throat, which is here, where we have a greater rate of attendance in the non-cerebral palsy population. Dentistry here, again, with a very a relatively small um, attendance rate for children and young people with cerebral palsy and dermatology, which I think is somewhere down here. I'm sure you can't read it because I can't, but, it, but here. And that just started to strike us that these are very much attendances for very routine type of problems for skin conditions, ear, nose and throat, uh, and oral and dental um, issues, which we felt are quite seriously underrepresented in this, pop this population and perhaps is an area of, to target for some attention. <coughs> As far as the admissions to paediatric intensive care, and you'll remember that this was an individual data set that we were able to look at, again, the issues around respiratory conditions, neurological conditions, are very much highlighted uh, at the top of these graphs with high problem rate in the uh, population with, uh, with cerebral palsy. And again, if we then move to the mortality data, respiratory conditions are the, le the leading cause of mortality in this, uh, this population. So this started to lead then to recommendation 13, which was very much around prioritizing the care of respiratory conditions in these children, in that each and every child and young person should have an assessment as to their uh, likelihood of respiratory compromise, and if there was a high risk of respiratory problems, a, a high prevalence of respiratory problems, then specialists in that area should be um, involved in the routine care of this population. 
to discuss with the family the range of interventions that are most likely to lead to the best outcome and what to do and who to contact in the event of respiratory symptoms because clearly it is a very prioritised morbidity that needs to be uh, looked into. And the second recommendation that we looked at was that oral health and dental care for uh, patients with neurodisabling conditions must be considered as a matter of routine by their lead uh, clinicians. We then looked um, at our transition, um, which you will remember was a, a prior priority objective of this piece of work. And we can discuss this, and this will be discussed in more detail going forward. But we were able to track um, the, the number of um, patients in outpatients who were being looked after in paediatric services according to their age. And you'll see if we look at um, the 18-year-olds, for example, where one would hope that um, most um, have been transferred into adult care, that for um, uh, these children, some uh, about 10% or so are um, in uh, paediatric services in the population without cerebral palsy, whereas for those with cerebral palsy, some 30% are still being looked at in paediatric services. And if we look at that, this data um, according to hospital admissions, we'll see that the discrepancy is even greater, whereas at the age of 18, we've got, again, some 10% are being cared for in paediatric wards, whereas in the um, cerebral palsy population, this is as great as 50%. And it's not until the age of about 21 to 22 or so that the vast majority have moved into adult services. So that concludes um, my presentation. And I hope that it reassures that there is something very useful out there in the analysis of um, nationally collected routine um, healthcare data. However, there is a lot of potential for it to be considerably better and hopefully in the future that's something that we can move towards. So Cathy, my colleague, I think is going to take over. Thank you Alison, um, thank you Karen and Heather and the team at NCPOD and University of Cardiff who have been fantastic people to work with, collaborate on this very complex project. So I'm just going to present a um, small proportion of the data back to the NCPOD data um, on inpatient care and transition. If you've had a chance to go online and look at the full report, you'll see that it is quite long, but it is modular, and there's good linkages between the NCPOD data and the University of Cardiff and um, Swansea data. There isn't time to present much more than that today. Just to lead you back to the fact that um, for the da NCPOD data collection, it does come from several different sources. So the denominator will change on the slides, and I'll try and draw your attention to that, those who haven't seen this data before. And I know reviewers who are in the audience, and thank you also for your input, um, will have seen some of this before in... Uh, initial presentations and in review. We've got in the report six principal recommendations and I will present mainly around those principal recommendations but there are 35 in total so I just draw you back to that. This data set, these data sets very much complement I think the recommendations made by NICE in the guideline presented about a year ago. And obviously that guideline development group um, set off after, after a little after we did um, in, our, in our quest. But I think it's, it should be seen, uh, the two projects as very much complementary. And there are things within the NCPOD and University of Cardiff data sets which have come out and which are actually some, somewhat different and reinforce and, uh, but also add more. So, just going on to um, principal recommendation 11, 
which is about emergency healthcare planning. Um, this is sometimes known, obviously, in Scotland as um, acute deterioration planning, um, but I think we know uh, what we're talking about here. And there are very good national directives to prepare such emergency healthcare plans, particularly for patients with a weight of chronic illness who are subject perhaps to acute deteriorations and who are looked after by many different healthcare teams so that if and when they present to acute care practitioners, for example, because of a deterioration, um, people understand what the plan is and quickly put that into place. So this is what the recommendation says, and now I'm going to present the data that helps support that. So just before I do go on to the seriously ill group, which I will mostly speak about in this area, just to give you an idea from reviewers, um, the weight of comorbidity, and this is not unexpected uh, that we should see this. So reviewers looked at the documented case notes, they looked at what um, uh, data was available from neurodisability leads in the form of clinic letters or sets of notes, and they also looked at questionnaire data. Um, and there's some discrepancy between this because, of course, this was not always recorded. But this is why the present column here is probably the most important. And you can see that there's a high uh, number of, of children, young people and young adults with the conditions that you would have expected in an inpatient population because that's where we took the sampling from. And Karen will speak about the paucity of GMFCS data which was presently was recorded. And we know, though, that a higher level of GMFCS patient will is likely to present to secondary care and that they are much more likely to have serious comorbidity. So this is not unexpected. What is important to note is of the emergency admissions, nearly a quarter were seriously ill, by which we meant that they either required level three intensive care, be it paediatric or adult, or they may well require it. And in fact, there were 32 admissions to critical care of these patients that were admitted urgently. So this is important to note. And obviously, again, we're talking about patients who often had comorbidity. Before I just itemise that, as with um, Alison's data, the, the age range was broken down into around five groups of about the same, um, same duration. What's interesting to me about this is that if you compare it with PicoNet data, national data, the biggest lump of children that present to paediatric critical care are the very young. But in cerebral palsy, it's right across the age range that children, young people and young adults are presenting to critical care. And this is indicative of their serious ongoing needs and comorbidities, which predispose them um, to some of the issues we've talked about, including severe respiratory illness. And within this chapter, there is complementary PicoNet data, which helps you understand this. So I've just highlighted here a few figures, and the numbers are too small to really quote percentages, but you can see they don't differ in terms of the proportions very much across from the very young to the much older. And the comorbidities, as were represented in the whole data set, are very, very high in this group. Epilepsy, lung disease, and also airway problems in about a third, um, which was a separate question, um, scoliosis and other serious comorbidities. Many were very dependent on additional technologies. Many had artificial feeding, required help from ventilation or CPAP long term, and had these other additional needs. Again, not surprising if you have a picture in your mind of the sort of patient that may require this type of help and present seriously unwell. So back to emergency healthcare planning. 
on an organisational level, and this is um, quite complex because it is from uh, the different, just in this particular slide, the six different sources of organisational data, yeah, from left to right, paediatric outpatient care across to emergency department care. This was whether, on an organisational level, emergency health care planning was in place. So when we went to medical directors or leads of service, we asked them, does your organisation have in place a good system for emergency health care planning for this population? And there's, uh, the best it was was around paediatric outpatients and not so good, though the numbers are much smaller for, pediatric, for adult outpatient care. So what this says to me is there was a, a better level of preparedness, at least, perhaps, or in paediatrics, but it's by no means perfect. Reviewers were asked to look and see whether there was evidence of emergency health care planning in case notes. And this was incredibly badly done in terms of whether this was present. So this was not quite 8% of notes. Was there any evidence of emergency health care plans? Now, we know that these plans might be held by the patient and their family, but one would expect evidence in case notes, some mention of the fact that there was an emergency health care plan. We asked um, admitting clinicians the same question, and in 20 cases only, they had knowledge of these emergency health care plans. So really, no better. Here is a case study. Now you'll see in the report when you get to look at it, but also at the back of the short report, 31 case scenarios, which are anonymized but accurate stories of real healthcare situations for children and young people and young adults with cerebral palsy. So this was a typical case of a young adult who had high needs in terms of needing a tracheostomy, had seizures, was under the care of a respiratory clinician with support from a neurologist in a different centre. Perhaps that expertise wasn't available locally for complex epilepsy care. The patient had had a similar admission three weeks earlier with no clear ongoing management plan, no emergency health care plan, no ongoing management plan. They got excellent outreach care from critical care for their tracheostomy and their respiratory support, but there was no leadership. So on reflection, case reviewers, some of whom are here, thank you for coming as well, felt there was a real lack of leadership. And this was often fundamental, as well as the lack of emergency health care planning to successful overall multidisciplinary care, and was more evident in the older patients and young, in, in that I mean young adults. And I'm going to go on to talk about transition. And Alison's already presented some really compelling data, which I think is extremely interesting and is uh, reflective also what we've seen within the case note data. So there's a set of recommendations. As you know, the recommendations go right across the care pathway, but are set on transition. And this is one that um, I've pulled out as, because it's the principal one. And essentially, within this, you may say, well, NICE said this two years ago, um, but actually, yes, they, and yes, they did. Uh, and there's no harm with reinforcing that, I don't think that we need inclusion, we need joined up thinking, but also we need joined up thinking with primary care. So NICE said that all young people must have a lead general practitioner. And that was something we also looked for in um, this study. So where is the, where's the evidence around transition? First of all, I'm just going to lead you back, and this is presented in the chapter 12 on transition to um, where patients went to. So this is organisational data and we asked organisations this time the 90 relates to inpatient paediatric units where their patients went to after transition. Who 
was going to take on the baton of care. And in the vast majority, this was non-specific in the sense they went to general medical, general orthopaedic, general surgical, but no specific care pathways, protocols for adjustment in the majority of organisations. This was at organisational level. This is data from um, clinicians responsible for the acute care episode. We asked them a simple question, we thought, about describing where they thought that patient sat in terms of their descriptor. Were they a child? Were they an adolescent or young person? Or were they an adult? And I, we could ask Christopher and Georgia what they would feel about this. So if you're at the age between 15 and 19, do you consider yourself an adult? Do you consider yourself a child? Because some people were still calling you a child. But at 10 to 14, are you a child? Is this reflective of the fact that we don't actually have good facilities or care pathways for young people and adolescents? I think this is just something to reflect upon. But again, at organisational level, this is just two sets of organisations, acute paediatric care, again, but also versus acute adult care. We asked organisations what their upper limit for care was. And this is sort of mirroring what Alison's talking about, that talked, spoke about as well in terms of the national data. Now, these numbers are small, but if you're a, 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 a sort of ordinary young person, then the limit is going to be more likely 16 or 18 years. But if you're with somebody with neurodisability, no, you might stay longer in paediatric care. Why is that? Is there nowhere to go? Is that the issue? So we asked case reviewers, you're, some of whom are here again, to look for evidence of transition either occurring or having occurred. Now remember that NICE says at 14 this should be in place. So the 15 to 19 year old age group is the one that's particularly interesting to me and so few of that group seem to have any evidence in their case notes of either transitioning or have had transitioned to adult care. So this is supportive. But what's more surprising is that even patients aged 20 to 25 didn't necessarily have evidence of having transitioned successfully. Here's a case study that illustrates that in a young adult who is at GMFCS level three. So um, I won't try and classify anybody um, around this, but it's a very good <coughs> classification system, really, I think, that should be used more widely. But this young person was in a wheelchair at school and they were going to go to university 50 miles away and they needed continued healthcare support and probably had had it extremely well delivered by an MDT within paediatrics. But who was going to deliver it thereafter? And this was really worrying to the reviewers. Uh, we reflected on the fact in the meeting that there were a paucity of adult neurodisability leads who would be taking on the baton and that the care in those teams was somewhat different in the way the pattern of develop of the way it looked um, the MDT is not really that well formed very often and that often the neurodisability lead is in charge of spasticity care one element only and nobody's joining it up that it's often up to the GP interested surgeons or of course the family to organise things thereafter and families often feel abandoned so do patients too at this stage in their life when they should be feeling um, empowered and being included and feeling much more independent about life what an amazing thing to get to go to university just as George has said earlier and then find yourself really without uh, care just briefly, this, uh, there's a whole chapter, chapter six, on communication. But obviously communication is terribly important. 
in the age group we're talking about, young people in a stage of maturity when they want to be involved in decision making uh, and have some level of independence. And this recommendation comes from this, so it didn't, it's not a principal recommendation, but I think it's relevant here to just mention around transition. In terms of inclusion or documentation of inclusion, the case reviewers, when they looked at the notes, and this is for the whole age group, not just for the older group, were concerned that there was lack of inclusion um, in so many, basically. Uh, documentation of inclusion of the patient in the decision-making process. And I think this is very important. In terms of um, systems in place in organisations, and then this again, this is a busy slide and looks again at um, seven, um, sorry, six organisational uh, questionnaires. But again, there are issues here with involving young people um, and best interest decision making in patients without capacity, which is generally, um, it differs somewhat across the UK, but certainly in England and Wales would be anybody at 16 and over. So lastly, so these are just highlighting this, and it would seem in this case possibly to be slightly better in adult care, possibly because in adult world we're dealing with elderly patients without capacity but then we've got also a cohort of patients with who may or may not lack capacity will certainly have communication issues where this is really important to them so lastly we're not presenting any surgical data today but there were about 150 perioperative cases that are um, in there in the report but this is a case which was not atypical of a young adult uh, at GMFCS2 who did have learning disabilities and admitted for routine surgery and the records indicated that the patient was needle phobic and needed considerable persuasion to have pre-meds before attending the operating theatre not unusual in this age group but the patient's carer was the sole signatory on the consent form and there was no record in the notes of the patient's mental capacity and their own view about having this surgery. So this was clearly very unsatisfactory and was not the only case that we saw, but is a good example of um, a situation, a very serious situation, where a young person's view is not taken into account. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Karen Horridge, who as we've heard is a, an expert on neurodisability, um, to give us our final set. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Cathy, and thank you everybody who's been involved in um, this uh, study. I'd like us to hold the thought of what the young people started out with, speaking about their experience, Christopher and Georgia. It's really, really important as we think about the findings of this study that we remain focused on the, the people um, uh, about whom each and every need matters and that we do genuinely, as they asked us to do, listen to what they are telling us each and every need that matters to them uh, actually is. So I'm going to follow a similar pattern to Cathy and focus on some of the principal recommendations, starting with the third recommendation of many, um, uh, which kind of states the obvious. If I was a person with cerebral palsy, I'd want the most expert person possible to tell me whether that was the condition that I had got, uh, and to be very confident that the services were appropriately expert. But from the evidence of the report, which I will go on to uh, elaborate on, that isn't always the case, which is why we felt it was really important to get it up there uh, that we believe that anybody with a neurodisabling condition should have access to a competent and expert assessment by somebody who can think about all the possibilities of what might be going on, not just the first diagnosis, but all the other things that we've heard about that might be there as well. And there are already published guidance. We've heard about NICE. I think NICE is the National Institute for Clinical 
excellence and it changes its name periodically, but it's the England body that makes a lot of these standards. But there's also an excellent um, reference and training manual that's been uh, produced across Europe uh, by the surveillance of cerebral palsies in Europe, and anybody can access this um, and um, access really good training material. So there are resources there that people can look at. So why did we feel that we needed to make this as a recommendation? Well, this was because when we looked uh, into the weeds, we've heard about coding and how difficult it was to pick up um, people with cerebral palsies from coding. Well, that was because our, is the clinician actually uh, writing down what the diagnosis is in the records? How coding works for inpatients is it's not a clinician that does the coding. It's somebody who's trained as a coder who does the coding, who's trying to interpret what the doctor or uh, practitioner has put in the notes. So what we found uh, was that the sp very specific cerebral palsy diagnosis was recorded at some point in about 80%, but that meant that 20% didn't have a very specific diagnosis in their record. And in uh, nearly a third, the term that was used to describe the condition was cerebral palsy, and there wasn't anything more specific that said, which type of cerebral palsy is it? Because cerebral palsy isn't a single condition. It's an umbrella term for a whole range of conditions. And the management of each of them is uh, fundamentally different. And the issues that each of them throws up are different. So uh, in another 14.6%, uh, the term bilateral cerebral palsy was used, which means we knew it affected both sides of the body but again there wasn't any more specific information about was this um, spasticity which means stiff all the time uh, was it uh, dystonia which means stiff sometimes but not other times but the management's completely different and we know there's a nice guidance on spasticity management but if you've not even described whether the uh, child or young person has spasticity or not it's very difficult to move to the next um, uh, step um, so we found that in 57% of cases, the diagnostic term that was recorded in the notes didn't have that very specific information about the tone variation. So that's why we thought we needed to make a recommendation about this, because we want expert assessment up front so things are described properly, recorded properly, and that can then inform expert care uh, going on. So I think case studies tell the story uh, much more clearly for us to understand. Um, and this was about a teenage patient who was reviewed in the paediatric clinic. And in the notes, because once things get written in notes, they tend to be set in tablets of stone sometimes. And I think we need to be brave always to challenge and look for our own evidence. Is this really what's going on here? Let's listen to the whole story. Let's listen to the uh, child or young person's journey. Um, uh, so... Um, what the reviewer noticed in this situation was that although the term used was ataxic cerebral palsy, the clinical assessment that had been documented didn't fit with that pattern because needs had changed over time. So the reviewer did note that there was evidence then of further investigation by a clinician to find out that this wasn't in fact a, a cerebral palsy at all, but one of a rare group of progressive and changing conditions that needed a completely different um, action plan. I'm really keen in managing children and young people, uh, um, listening to what they say, um, uh, who've got cerebral palsies or any disabling conditions in proactive uh, healthcare, which means being a step ahead, thinking about what might happen next so you can prevent the preventable and uh, keep the outcomes as good as possible. What we don't want is passive monitoring of the natural history of a condition. We want to be proactive. We want to be a step ahead. Um, so we think it's always good practice to think and reflect, look for any evidence. Is the diagnosis really what it says at the top of the letter? Uh, and be prepared to revisit that in the light of new technologies. We've already heard, uh, including from Georgia, about the importance of multidisciplinary team working. And when you've got complexity of needs, it's really important that everybody's expertise is brought to bear because it's not just one person who can manage um, uh, everything. So we need to have uh, access for everybody with a disabling condition to an appropriate multidisciplinary team uh, when they need it and when their situation changes.
We know that multidisciplinary team working is essential, but we found in our study considerable variation in the clarity about who led this multidisciplinary team. And we've heard about that, especially for young adults. Multidisciplinary team uh, working was assessed by the case note reviewers, thank you very much, and found to be inadequate in nearly half, 48.1% of cases that we reviewed. There's work to be done. We heard about that all from George again about that important uh, communication between people in the team and that it doesn't always happen. And we found evidence of this in that discharge summaries after an episode of inpatient care wasn't always copied to the lead uh, clinician for that um, uh, person's care in about half of cases. And as for the poor physios, well, they were lucky if they got a letter um, uh, at all in um, uh, uh, probably 70% uh, because only 30% of community physios were copied in um, uh, for day cases and 38% for admitted um, uh, cases. We found evidence in the case notes of what the reviewers considered adequate post-operative physiotherapy input in less than 6 out of 10 um, situations. So again, case studies bring this to life and help us to understand the implications of this for the child or young person. So a young child with cerebral palsy affecting both sides of their body, um, uh, spastic, which means uh, stiff, was admitted as a day case for an intervention that's commonly used, uh, botulinum toxin injections. This was completed um, and there were no documented um, complications. So what the reviewer noted is it had been clearly documented that what was needed was intensive physiotherapy in the community. The intervention itself isn't what's going to make the difference. What the botulinum toxin injection was doing was allowing the physiotherapy to be more effective. Um, but if there hadn't been that chain of communication handing on of the baton so that the community physio knew that the intervention was going to occur, then they weren't able to plan their diary to make sure that that intensive intervention occurred. And I think we'll be hearing more from our physiotherapy colleagues this afternoon about their reflections on our findings. Principal recommendation 18. There should be a clear care plan that des describes and addresses each and every need. And for those with cerebral palsies, what we know matters pain, hugely important. There's been internationally respected work led by Professor um, Alan Culver and the Sparkle uh, collaboration across Europe um, that has evidenced that pain is a major determinant of the quality of life and participation in everyday activities for young people um, uh, with cerebral palsies. We know this, there is evidence, um, uh, so we need this to be in the care plan. Growth, nutrition, safety of eating and drinking, other medical conditions, mental health and behavioural issues, all these different aspects need to be in the care plan uh, because if they're not in the care plan, um, we worry that they're not uh, going to be addressed. And the uh, uh, opportunity should be used of a hospital admission to review that care plan and to make sure that each and every need is indeed identified so that it has the chance of being proactively um, addressed. So, um, uh, what about care pathways? What did organisations say uh, are in place uh, across organisations? I think what's really worrying before we get on to the content of care pathways is to look at the leads, what the leads for different aspects of service were telling us um, about pathways not even being uh, in place at all. So 56 out of 82 lead clinicians for paediatric outpatient care said they didn't have a care pathway um, for uh, children and young people who are disabled or with cerebral palsies. Uh, a half, 42 out of 81, of community paediatric teams, and we've heard that these are major players in the assessment and care of this group of children and people, didn't have a clear written care pathway. And this goes up again, 42 out of 48, significant percentage of leads for adult outpatient care said they didn't have a clear care pathway. Where such care pathways were in place, they were said to include things that we want them to be including, like hip surveillance, access to imaging, uh, uh, assessments of growth and nutrition, monitoring of the spine. Um, but what was less embedded was 
are people identifying pain? Are they asking questions about pain? Uh, and is pain management being addressed? We've heard about this mysterious thing called the GMFCS. So just to give a, a bit of background, the Gross Motor Function Classification System was first described over 20 years ago and is internationally recognised as a scale of the uh, uh, function of the motor function of um, uh, people with uh, cerebral palsy. So if you have a gross motor function classification system level one, you can move around. If you're at level two, you can move around but might need to hold on as you go upstairs. If you're at level three, you can move around but might need a uh, assistive device to do so. If you're at level four, you're likely to be in a power wheelchair or in a, uh, need a wheelchair for your independent mobility. And if you're at level five, you're likely to be totally dependent on others for all of your your care and mobility. We've already heard that the case identification process for this study had to be based on episodes of inpatient care because at the moment there isn't comprehensive enough collection of data about uh, what happens in uh, outpatients. So necessarily the sample of children and young people that were included in the study were skewed towards those with the greatest level of need that were more likely to, to be dependent on others for their uh, mobility. Uh, the gross motor function classification system, as I said, internationally recognised, and we need to know what the level is if we need to know what we're doing with hip surveillance, what we're doing with monitoring, what we're doing with uh, management. However, the overarching uh, finding was that uh, the gross motor function classification system was written down in the case notes of only 28.3% of the patients overall, which is less than a third. So despite there being internationally respected evidence that this is what we should be using, um, uh, uh, what we found documented in the notes uh, was that this uh, um, it isn't the case, and this is across um, uh, age groups and particularly not recognised in, um, in the young adults. pain. We've already uh, spoken about the importance of pain to joining in everyday activities um, and the limitations that it can cause if it's present. Um, and our study evidenced that we're not uh, there yet in terms of the adequacy of it, our inquiries about pain. Lead clinicians for disability care reported that pain inquiries were inadequate in 13%. The case note reviewers were more hawk-like um, in their attention to detail and felt that this was inadequate in 38.4%. Uh, Where pain was found to be present, was there an adequate management plan to address it? This was felt not to be in the uh, uh, case notes in 22.2% uh, and um, uh, pain was evidenced as not adequately controlled in 35.5%. I think there's a lot of work here uh, to be done and salutary messages. And to me, uh, today is the beginning, not the end. The report is only going to be useful if it's translated into improved practice and improved outcomes that matter for children and young people. So each and every need, let's come back to the title of the report. Um, are we using the opportunity, every opportunity, to describe each and every need and how the cerebral palsy is affecting the uh, uh, individual person? Case note reviewers were of the opinion that there was room for improvement in the description of how the person's cerebral palsy affected their health in 38.2% how it affected their mobility in 47.8%, and how it affected their social functioning in nearly two-thirds. It's not... We need to go back always to think about the person and their needs. If we're not picking up how somebody uh, is able to communicate, move around, then we're not going to be um, uh, making the right adjustments to make sure that they're getting the best outcome opportunities. Here we cover another range of each and every need. We need to tune in to the level of a person's learning ability. We know that those with a learning disability from other uh, big uh, internationally recognised pieces of work um, 
uh, uh, that people with a learning disability have poorer outcome opportunities, often because of something called diagnostic overshadowing, where everybody blames the disability rather than going about things in a systematic way as they would for somebody without a disability to find out that actually they've got appendicitis or earache or uh, whatever else is going on. So if we are going to tune in to how we best uh, approach people, how we communicate, the language we use. We need to be understanding their level of learning ability and where they've got a learning disability, this needs to be documented. And this wasn't consistent in our um, uh, study. We need to know the preferred communication method of individuals. So we, we heard from Christopher, uh, who very uh, clearly explained how he can say yes or no, but we need to check on that every time we meet uh, somebody, because things can change as well. But we need to know what somebody's communication preferences are, uh, so that we can make the right adjustments and can hear the important voice of the child or young person. Big bugbear of mine is weight. You know, everybody gets weighed and measured at every outpatient clinic and every uh, inpatient clinic, except it would appear uh, if you have a disability. Um, and uh, I'm afraid we're not so good at documenting weight when somebody uh, has a, um, a disabling condition. So um, weight was not documented in the case notes of uh, nearly a third of um, admitted patients and 41.2% of day case patients. However, there was clinical concern expressed by the leads for disability care about weight, growth and nutrition in 29.1%. 59.5% of patients were described as nutritionally vulnerable by the reviewers uh, assessments of, uh, of all the available information. However, regular assessment of nutritional status um, was not in place for everybody and certainly not for 13.5%. Let's come on to another case study uh, to uh, bring this to life, to tell us why it matters. So a young child with cerebral palsy affecting both sides of their body um, and multiple associated health conditions was admitted to hospital with a chest infection. They were given antibiotics, um, observed overnight and sent home. Another young person was a, um, a, a brought in as a, uh, um, for a day case procedure. Uh, their gross motor classification uh, system level was uh, uh, four, so in a, a wheelchair, dependent to some extent for their mobility. They needed some botulinum toxin injections. The procedure was completed and uh, off they went home. For neither of these situations was the weight of the person documented in the notes. Yet we know that uh, complexity, vulnerability, brings a high risk of nutritional compromise, difficulties uh, with uh, weight and undernutrition. We also know that if we're to work out and calculate the doses of an antibiotic or of an intervention accurately, that that is based on weight. And if our estimate of weight is that finger in the air and see which way the wind's blowing, um, or you know, make a judgment from the end of the bed, you wouldn't do that for anybody else. So um, uh, there's work to be done here as well. Most often, the reasons given for not weighing somebody as well, we didn't have a hoist, we didn't have wheelchair scales, um, and, and we, too difficult, couldn't do it. So moving on to those all important facilities, again, echoing what we heard from our earlier uh, presentations. How these uh, spider graphs work um, is it's looking at uh, access to outpatient facilities and different aspects from hoists to wheelchair scales, making reasonable adjustments, parking, ramps, toilets. If there are no problems, then you'd be right in the middle of the uh, diagram. If um, uh, lead practitioners for different aspects of service with uh, uh, reporting problems, um, then the more problems, the further out onto the radar chart the uh, graph uh, takes you. So from this, we can see that paediatric community care has a problem with hoists. And yet we've learnt that the predominant lead for care of disabled children and young people is in the community. But there are no hoists. Is this good enough? No, it's not good enough. And you know, what is really frustrating is you know, environment is something we ought to be able to do something about. Environment, getting the doors wide enough, getting the access right, 
is the very minimum that we should be able to do, but we are still struggling. So hoists, still a problem in paediatric outpatients, also appropriate. Scales are a problem. Have you got wheelchair scales in all your settings? Changing places. You know, oftentimes where changing places were provided, they were reported to be available for babies, the pulley down things that you get in a lot of places. But if you've got a, a young adult who's profoundly disabled and needs to be changed urgently because they're uncomfortable, have you got a changing place uh, that isn't the floor of the public loo um, uh, that is appropriate and dignified and available um, uh, in your facilities? Also in inpatients, appropriate scales and hoists are again a, 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 a perhaps less of a problem than in outpatients, uh, but still uh, significantly problematic. And I think this, these are issues that we need to be raising with the facilities uh, folk and, uh, and, and raising the, you know, the basic human rights of, uh, of, of access and equality of outcome opportunities. So in summary, what our study has found, and there, uh, it's a long study, there's a lot to be said, there's a lot of recommendations, but there's a lot of work to be done. And we have highlighted that there is considerable variation in the identification and management of each and every need of children and young people with cerebral palsies across settings, over time and with age. We commend to you all this Child Health Outcome Review and commend it to all who provide healthcare for disabled children and young people. Because if each and every recommendation of each and every needs report were to be implemented, then unwanted variation in care and thus unwanted variation in outcomes uh, should uh, be addressed. I don't want this to be all doom and gloom. We need to have a note of optimism. The fact that you're here today means that you want to do something about it. So I leave you the words of Ads the poet. Um, Ads is a young man who's sadly no longer with us, who had cerebral palsy and uh, uh, used to use Twitter a lot and enjoyed tweeting his uh, poems. And this is one of Ads' uh, uh, poems, Spring. I am March. April, May. I am new life starting today. I am bright and brisk. I am a flying, fluttering kite. I am trees in the breeze. I am cold. Go away, please. I am the sun in the sky. I am wispy clouds. Hi. Thank you for listening and uh, thank you for being champions of this Child Health Outcome Review. And together, I believe that we really can make the difference that matters. Thank you.